So last week I had this sermon I was going to preach, and I'm, I'm going to do my best. I'm just going to fly through it. Does that sound good? Um, we're going we're gonna to continue a sermon series right now, uh, wildly. Um, you're, just, you're not even going to believe this. This is just so crazy. After everything we just said about just wanting Jesus in our lives, we're going to continue a series called I Believe, where we're talking about the Apostles' Creed. And today, like right now, we're going to talk about Jesus. Isn't that crazy? Like how... I tried to talk about it last week, and then we got interrupted with something better. Um, it's just good. And, and I, I'm just going gonna, gonna to be, be real honest with you right now and just say that um, I've got a lot of notes, and I'm going to do my best to, to fly through them as fast as I, as I possibly can. Does that sound good? In John chapter 14, you can take a look at this with me on the screen. Jesus says to his disciples, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That's really good news. And I'll take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas said. Lord, Thomas is always the one with questions. And so Thomas goes, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. Jesus, I, I pray that you would help me to uh, be really clear about you today as we talk about how we believe in Jesus, how we believe in you. Um, Holy Spirit, give me the ability to be clear. Um, but God, also um, help me to be yeah, just really clear. I guess I, we probably have lunch plans. God, we're about to talk about the most important thing that anyone could ever hear in the history of the human race, so we want to be clear. We believe in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen. Uh, this series that we're in right now is rooted in the Apostles' Creed, and so I want to read that to you now so you can see where we are in this series. Um, last, well, two weeks ago, last time we talked about the Apostles' Creed, we started uh, in, the, in the initial statement, uh, and then today we're going to get into this huge middle chunk. So there's a lot of ground we're going to cover today. Um, but let me read to you the Apostles' Creed. At the end of our service, we'll pray this together uh, as a confession and as a prayer. But the Apostles' Creed goes like this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, I always love, by the way, that it says the word amen at the end of this confessional statement because it reminds us to pray this. This is something I want to be, to have uh, be true and become more and more true uh, in and about my life. Um, now, again, like I said, the last time we talked about the creed, as we're walking through these foundational statements of what it is that we believe, um, that we talked about the idea of belief, and we talked about God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And the reason why we are walking through this series through the creed, and, and the timely nature of this, because as God is moving all these dynamic things that he's doing, it is really wise to make sure we are well-rooted in truth. And so the Apostles' Creed is this ancient, in fact, it's one of the first statements that the disciples of Jesus came up with to say, we want to make sure that we don't have what's called heresy or false teachings in, mixed in with our beliefs. So we're going to say these things are what we believe. These are foundational. In other words, if you don't agree with the Apostles' Creed, you aren't a Christian. So it's really important that we agree on these things. Now today, like I said, we're going to focus on Jesus. The Creed makes... 
depending on how you read it, but for our purposes today, I'm going to tell you the creed makes five claims about Jesus that we will walk through together. Five claims. I told you I had a lot, so let's get going. Um, I, I will just say that we're not going to do a deep dive into any of these claims individually, but my purpose today is to, as we walk through all five of these claims that the Apostles' Creed makes about Christ, my proposal for you is that if even one of them was removed, then all of it would be meaningless. And so I want to walk through all five statements today so that you can see we believe all of these things about Christ and all of them equally matter. You understand? Uh, So today we begin with the statement, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. Like that's the thing that most of us are like, yep, good there. I've got it, right? Let's talk about this real quick. I mean, right off the bat, we are not saying simply that we believe Jesus existed, Like, we're not saying Jesus is historically a person. He was, but we're not saying that. We're saying that Jesus was historically a person who is God. That's what we're saying. And not only was he God, but he's our Lord. That's a robust statement. You cannot just say, I believe Jesus existed and call yourself a Christian. You have to say, I believe he existed, that he is God, and he is the Lord of my life. I believe that. Threefold statement completely. Amen? Now, uh, it, it, to believe that He is the Son of God and our Lord means you place your belief in Him more than simply having beliefs about Him. So immediately this becomes relational, right? To believe and agree with Scriptures, uh, that, to, to believe and agree with what Scripture says about Jesus. For example, Scripture says this about Jesus in John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. In your Bible, there's a really good chance that the word Word is capitalized there. There's a personification of the word Word. It means the Word is a person. The Word has special recognition in Scripture. It says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Not just that God had a Bible, but the Word was with God. And listen to this, the Word was God. In the beginning of all things, before anything was created that was ever created, the Word was God and the Word was with God. He was with God. Now, automatically, John gives it away, right? This is a person in verse 2. What's the first word of verse 2? He. We're still talking about the Word. The book, the Word, is a he. Is a person. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him and apart from Him. Not one thing was created that has been created. Okay, so last time we talked about the creed, we said this. uh, Inspired by Malachi chapter 2, verse 10, that that God is the Father of all creation. Right? God the Father is the Father of all creation. Malachi chapter 2, verse 10 says, Are we not all children of the same Father? Are we not all created by the same God? So, God the Father created us. But in John chapter 1, it says that Jesus created us. So which is it? Yes. The answer is both. The answer is both. Because Jesus and the Father are one. But this foundational belief about Jesus also reveals to us that Jesus is not a created being. It is important that we understand that when we say that Jesus is God, God, that He is the Son of God, that He is our Savior and our Lord, that we are not saying that God the Father created God the Son, Jesus. Jesus did not come out of God the Father. He has always been God. Now, it is a heretical teaching to say that the Father became the Son and came to earth. That is heresy, meaning that you cannot call yourself a Christian if you believe that Jesus and God are, uh, are, are uh, linear beings, meaning that there was the Father and then He had to become the Son in order to come to earth and that heaven had been vacated for 30-odd years and then when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, that what that actually means is He ascended back to being the Father. This is not biblical teaching. Okay? So we do not believe this about Jesus. Scripture does not teach this. And this in in John teaches us that God and the God the Father and God the Son, the Father and Jesus, are both equally God, but they are separate, distinct persons of the Godhead. And next week we will talk about the Holy Spirit. The third person, equally God, separate, distinct person, all of the Godhead. 
And I've always said this, the Trinity is very difficult to understand. We'll talk about that a little bit next week. And if you can fully understand it and come up with the per perfect illustration, then we would have to begin to worship you because you understand something that human minds cannot actually understand. And then you would be like the fourth person of the Godhead. And that's problematic because then all of our doctrines and theology would fall apart and then we would just be like in big trouble. So we're going to try though. But here's what we know, is that Jesus is God. Can you just say to your neighbor, Jesus is God? Yeah, Jesus is not simply a man. He was not a created being. Nothing was created without Jesus, which means Jesus was not created. Right? At the beginning, when everything was created, the Word, Jesus, was already there doing the creating. Jesus, who came into the world, came to be 100% man, but he never stopped being 100% God himself. He is God. So, now, calling Jesus the Son of God makes him what we call, and I've used this term a moment ago, the second person of the Trinity. Okay, this does not mean second place. It's very important that we understand when we talk about the Trinity, we're talking about co-equal members, co-equal. Co-equal means no one is more or lesser than, co-equal members of the Godhead. Not second best, not, uh, there wasn't like some like cosmic Rochambeau game to figure out which one of these losers had to come and die for everybody. This was, this was actually God himself willingly surrendering to God himself, submitting to the authority of the Father to demonstrate what submission and surrender and relationship and love looks like to us. The Son did not need to submit to the Father, but he willingly did it to demonstrate what love looks like for us because we desperately need that. And they are so in love with each other in such a beautiful, holistic, and healthy way that submission one to another does not mean lesser than. It actually is a source and a sign of power. And the world says that submission is bad and dictatorship because we woefully misunderstand what submission and love actually looks like. The Trinity shows us. So we say the second person of the Trinity is Jesus because Jesus willingly humbles himself to submit himself to the will of the Father, making himself the Son of God submitted to the Father. And then we are invited to submit our lives to Jesus as our Lord, which means we submit everything of ourselves to him, not just as our Savior, but as the shot caller of our life, right? You don't submit your ideas to Jesus and go, can you please approve this, sir? You say, Jesus, what would you have me do today? It's a subtle difference, but it changes everything. And by the way, this is made possible because of everything that comes next in the creed. So let's move on to the second statement of the creed. We say, I believe in the virgin birth. Will you say this with me? I believe in the virgin birth. Now, this might be the one that, like, the, you science nerds out there have the biggest problem with, and I totally get it. Like, this does not make sense. I actually think I understand the Trinity better than I understand the virgin birth. Um, I've had two kids, and I know what happened to get them on the planet. Um, like, no other, no other person besides Jesus got here the way Jesus got here. But I just, I would propose to you that anyone who says that the virgin birth does not matter in the story of Jesus. Like, I heard a, I heard a guy one time uh, who, unfortunately, was a trusted voice in, in many churches said one time, um, you know, if the virgin birth, if it turns out the virgin birth didn't really happen, it doesn't really change anything about the gospel. And I just propose to you that it would mean that Jesus was not God. So to believe in the virgin birth says uh, that you take what the creed states, which is that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. The word conceived shows up in scriptures a few times, like for example in Matthew chapter 1, it says an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her, in other words, life placed into her, is from the Holy Spirit. So linking the conception of Christ both to the Holy Spirit and to Mary is absolutely vital because it's the conception by the Holy Spirit that shows us how Jesus arrived in Mary's womb. Jesus comes out of a womb that he should not have been able to come out of because she was a virgin. 
and, and also, on the other hand, conception by Mary and by no other human being in partnership with Mary is what enables us to, to know for certain that Jesus was human, born of a human woman, but also without removing his divinity, his deity, because he was born conceived of the Holy Spirit. So theologians call this birth as Jesus, 100% God and 100% human. They, they call that the incarnation. To incarnate literally means invested with human nature and form. This is God invested with human nature and form. Looking back again at John chapter 1, where John writes, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Listen to the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases it in the message. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. Again, friends, the incarnation, the birth of Christ conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary is absolutely vital to our faith as Christians. In the Supreme Mystery, J.I. Packer wrote, the Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby, needing to be fed and changed and taught to talk like any other child. The more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as this truth of the Incarnation. I mean, we're going to move on. But at some point this week, come back to the incarnation. Just think about the, the idea of the incarnation of God, that all of God somehow managed to, to, to fold himself up into a human baby in the womb. If that doesn't blow your mind, now I'm not sure that I know what would. <laughs> God, 100%. Human, 100%. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God and our Lord, and that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin, Mary. Three, I believe in the suffering and death of Jesus. Would you say this with me? I believe in the suffering and death of Jesus. The creed invites us to believe that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried, and descended to the dead. Now, I, I know we probably all know the Easter story and the, and the Christmas story, and we're, we'll probably come back around to those. I know Easter is coming up. Um, but So you're probably familiar with the story of Jesus' death and burial. So within the creed, let's put our attention on two places that we might actually have some questions uh, that we probably won't talk about around Easter. So number one, uh, I want to answer this question. Why was the villain specifically named? Like, why do we name Pontius Pilate? I've got a couple of thoughts there. And then number two, what does it mean that Jesus descended to the dead? I've got a couple of thoughts there. And then so, so we'll understand why it is incredibly important that we say this. So first, why is Pilate named? Now, I, I think for at least three reasons. Number one, I think that Pilate is named in the Apostles' Creed to point to the historicity of Jesus' death. So we know in human history, it's been recorded in history books, that Pilate, Pontius Pilate, was uh, the, the fifth Roman magistrate to serve in the province of Judea, and he ruled from 26 to 36 AD, which is the window of time when Christ was crucified and rose from the dead. So we know that somewhere towards the, the end of the life of Jesus Christ that this guy, Pontius Pilate, was the Roman magistrate. Like, we just know that in, his, in history. It's a historical fact. And so to name Pontius Pilate in the creed says, we believe in a Jesus who actually lived in human history. But that's the easy one. I think another one, that another reason why we name Pontius Pilate in the Creed is to highlight that it was worldly power that was used to kill Jesus. Friends, every single time the church or religious people go after worldly power, something about that captures our spirit and we begin to behave like people who would kill Jesus. Over the last several years, it has been so apparent that the church in America is hungry for power. And you've heard me talk, if you've been around here, a lot about how that gets us in a lot of trouble, that I do not believe that the Bible teaches us that Christians should have earthly power. But we don't need earthly power. We've got kingdom authority. Right? That's better. 
Now, I'm not saying that that means that you shouldn't be involved in the political systems of the world. Like, vote. Use your voice. Have at it. Praise God for that. Praise God for the freedoms that you're able to have in this country. And, and I mean that. Like, you should praise God for that. But never forget that you were not a, born a Christian, so like born, again, into salvation so that you could gain political power. Because it was political power that drives us to the death of Jesus on the cross. It was manipulation of earthly power that was used to the very death of the Savior on the cross. And it is important that we remember that. That does not mean that every politician would kill Jesus if given the chance. That is not what I'm saying. It also doesn't mean that every politician is the villain. Friends, pray for politicians. I mean, they've got a hard job. Pray for those people. And if you want to be one, oh, pray for you. Why? Why would you want to do that? That's a hard job. But we would pray for you. <laughs> That's a hard job. It's a noble job. Absolutely. But it is the spirit of power in politics in the world that brought Jesus to the cross. And it is important that we remember that. And third, I believe that Pilate is named in the creed, and most importantly, to invite us to put our own name there. To put our own name. To say, I believe that Christ suffered under my sin, under my power, under my choices, that he suffered, was crucified, died, buried, and descended to the dead. It's an invitation to be Pilate to confess your own being complicit in the death of Christ. It was your sins, my sins, our humanity that hung him there on the cross. And we name ourselves and say, it was me, I did it. And if you can't do that, then you're not ready to receive what comes on the other side of the cross. So I put my name there. Thank you, Jesus, for the humanity in the middle of this prayer. So this is, I think, a few reasons why we put Pilate's name in the middle of the creed when we talk about Jesus. But then the next question is, and this is a question that comes up quite a bit, uh, as we say that Jesus was uh, buried and then he descended to the dead. The next question is, where in the world did Jesus go when he died? The creed includes this statement, descended to the dead, first and foremost, to reinforce the idea that he actually died. We talk about Pilate in the creed to reinforce the idea that he actually lived in human history, and it's important that we reinforce the idea on the other end that he actually died. Physical, actual death. And when Jesus died, he went to the same place where all the dead go. Now, I told you we're not going to get super deep into all of these things, right? So I'm going to, let me just fly here and we can have lunch and talk about all of the details of this at some point. Uh, let me just use some broad brush stroke terms and then there's some like nitty gritty in there that I won't touch on. So if you feel like I'm missing something, you're probably right, but it's for sake of time. I've already taken too, time, too much time giving you the preface to this statement. Okay, we would believe that Jesus went to a place called Hades, which is a spiritual holding place for the, un, for, for the, the righteous and unrighteous, and that Hades is like this, this, this massive holding place. Many people actually believe it's actually in the heart of the planet Earth, like it's, it's down there, right? And that within Hades, there is, there is uh, there's, there's, Sheol is a word that gets used sometimes, but the most popular, uh, m most helpful phrase is that within this place, Hades, the place of the dead, uh, is this, this area, this, this place within there called Abraham's bosom. Some people call it Abraham's side or Abraham's lap. Maybe you've heard this term before. And the idea is that the righteous, the, the believers of God, the followers of God, when they die, would go to this place. We, we can't go to the eternal new heaven and new earth yet because Jesus hasn't made that yet, right? We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so there has to be somewhere where people go when they die. There's a, there's a story in the Old Testament, or sorry, in the New Testament where Jesus actually talks about the idea that, that, that a, an unrighteous person and a righteous person are both dead and they seem to be able to communicate to each other. 
even in the, this, so there's this idea that there was, a, there was a place where the unrighteous would go the, and a place where the righteous would go, almost as if like the, the goats and the sheep were being divided by God. So it's almost like, because he paints that picture for us in scripture. And, and, then, uh, and then Jesus will come at some point. And when he came at some point, it was right after on the cross in his physical body, he said the words, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit, right? Now, he said to the person next to him on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. This idea of Abraham's bosom, we're coming back around to this, Abraham's lap or Abraham's side, is an- another term for that was paradise. The place where the righteous would go when they die. Right? It's not eternal heaven yet. That's actually a different place. It's not ready for us yet. But this place where the righteous would go. And Jesus, it says, it says he descended down into the earth. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9, it says Jesus descended to the lower parts of the earth. And in 1 Peter 3, verses 18 through 19, it says he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. So while his body was dead in the tomb, his spirit went to Hades, to Abraham's bosom, and he made a proclamation. And I believe that the, he made the same proclamation to the spirits that were dead as he made to the living world. It is finished. And then we know that at some point, Jesus, it says, will uh, bring the captives into freedom. He will lead the captives to be free. That's good news. So where did Jesus go? He, He went where all, he didn't just immediately go and like have a latte with the Father in heaven. He went to the place where all, because he was fully human, so his spirit had to go, had to go to the place where all human spirits go when they die, which is great, because when Jesus shows up to the place where all the dead people are, (laughs) he's, he's like, he's coming with good news. The most alive dead person has ever been, walks into Hades and says, I have news for you. Now, for all of the ones who were the spirits of the people who died righteously, that's great news. And for all of those who died in unrighteousness, they see God come to them and say, it is finished. By the way, there's an entire line of thinking about how the demons would have responded to that moment. I I mean, just just because it's fun, just think about this for a second, right? Like, these are fallen angels, okay? They rebelled against God, and, and they are now tormenting the unrighteous in Hades, right? While they're also trying to like torment people on the earth, Jesus shows up and goes, hey boys, it's been a while. Remember me? God? I mean, I don't know if Jesus was like, ever, like if it was me, I'd be like, yeah, I can go tell them what's up. Ha ha ha, finally, right? I don't know about it. I don't know if Jesus, I think Jesus is probably way more humble than I am. But like, think of the victory in that moment. The rebellion of, of, of these angels who turn to demons who say, we are now going to do everything in our power to destroy the creation of God. And Jesus shows up and says, you lost. It's finished. It's finished. And by the way, he did that 2,000 years ago. And that promise and that declaration still holds true. Amen? Okay, which now all of this becomes even more powerful when we also say the fourth claim about the creed. I believe in the resurrection. I believe Jesus did not just die. I believe in the resurrection. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. Uh, my friend A.J. Swoboda said recently in a podcast, the resurrection is the second time Jesus comes out of a place that should have been closed. He came out of a virgin's womb, a place that should not have a baby, and he came out of a dead man's tomb. That's wild. It's like the virgin birth actually is a prophetic declaration of the resurrection of Christ. Have you ever made that connection? Like, no wonder he was born of a virgin, not just because it maintained his deity while also making him 100% human, but it was a picture of how he would save us. Coming out of something that should be impossible, because with God all things are possible. 
And by the way, Paul makes it very clear that believing in the resurrection is vital to Christian faith. In 1 Corinthians 15, check this out. He says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. Did you catch that? Paul is saying it's not actually enough to believe Christ died on the cross. You have to also believe in the resurrection. Because if not, then there is no life gifted to those who die in in faith in Christ. Right? So, verse 18, those then who have fallen asleep, if the resurrection is not true, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. Okay, let me just say, uh, there's this thing I talked about a couple weeks ago called Pascal's Wager that the philosopher Pascal said, look, at the very least, if you put your faith in Christ and live like a Christian and it turns out not to be true, then just wager this, at least you'll have lived as a good person, right? And I just propose to you that it is an incredibly fickle proposal for faith. It, It might be a good evangelistic tool to start a conversation, but that is not a good foundation to place faith in Christ. It is not strong enough. And here is why. Because Paul says, because if it turns out, it turns out that it's not true, then Pascal was wrong. It's not that you lived a good life. It's that you were a complete fool and you should be pitied above everybody else. You would put your faith in the virgin birth, the death of a man who never sinned and rose from a tomb that should not have let him out? You would put your faith in that, you fool! Unless you believe in the resurrection from the dead. Unless Jesus actually rose on the third day. I mean, which he did. He did. Friends, he is alive. And because of that, we also have eternal life. The resurrection of Jesus is what completes the work of salvation. Without it, we are still bound to death. The resurrection is the work that conquers death and gives us the ability, empowers us to receive eternal life from Jesus. Praise God. And then finally, the creed states, or invites us to say that I believe in the return of Jesus. This segment of the creed closes like this. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. By by the way, actually, one thing that I kind of moved up to the other point was that he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Uh, He's seated there. He will come to judge the living and the dead. Now, this is actually built on several several places in Scripture. Uh, Here's a couple. Mark chapter 16, verse 19. So the Lord Jesus, after speaking to them, was taken up into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 12 says, Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time and time, time after time, which can never take away sins. But this man, talking about Jesus, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Now just let that sink in for a second. Jesus, being seated at the right hand of the Father, actually says something. It actually means something important. And there's ac- we were talking about this a couple of Wednesday nights ago. If you're here on Wednesday night, you already know where I'm going with this. But, but this means that Jesus is not here. And that's incredibly important theologically. Jesus is not here. Jesus is not in this room right now. Jesus is not on earth. Jesus is not in America. Jesus is not in this church. Jesus is not filling a Jesus-sized hole in your heart. I propose to you that when we say prayers of salvation, Jesus, come into my heart, what we actually should be saying is, Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Because that's what Jesus taught us, right? Now, think about this. Um, Okay, let me just tell you a story. Yeah, I'll tell you a story. When I was eight years old, my parents divorced. And my relationship with my father fell apart. Most of you know this story. If you've been around, you know my story. You know my, my relationship with my dad fell apart. 
like sometimes it was rocky, but if I'm honest, most of the time just didn't exist. He just was gone, just not around. And when he was around, it wasn't great. And then as I got older and, and he got older and I became an adult, my response to him putting up a wall between he and I was, I bet I could build that wall even taller. I think I inherited some of that from him. Now, just this last Christmas, after 30 years of either rocky or mostly no relationship, my dad came from Scotland where he lives, runs a vegan bed and breakfast with my stepmom. If you want to go, I'll hook you up. They came for Christmas, my my dad and my stepmom. Some of you met them. They were here. They, They joined us for worship a couple of different times while they were here. And, and most of the details of this story are too long to tell you in the time that I have. But friends, can I just tell you that by the time my dad got in the car to leave Lancaster after 30 years, the Lord has, and when I say this, I am not exaggerating, completely reconciled our relationship. I mean, we went, out, we went out for a meal at one point. We're sitting at the dinner table. We'd had some conversations, and he said some things that I had been waiting three decades to hear him say. Unprompted, just out of nowhere, just something is going on in my heart. I just need to say these things. And, it was, and my response to him was, most of the time when people go that, say something that big, usually my response is, maybe you should cut yourself some slack. But, but honestly, Dad, that's exactly what I needed to hear you say after 30 years. Thank you so much. And then a couple of days later, we're sitting at dinner, and just he and I just go out to dinner, we're just talking, and he looks at me, and he goes, you know, the wall is gone, isn't it? And I go, yeah, it's completely gone. It's completely gone. I just love you. It's just nice to sit here with you. It's just like so good to be your son and to mean those words. Now, why am I telling you that? Because you know what made that meaningful? You know what makes me want to cry when I tell you that story? Is the 30 years. The distance. The being gone. There is something profoundly beautiful in the wait and the waiting. I'm not saying, like, don't get me wrong, like, I'm so glad my dad was gone for 30 years. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that at all. It was deeply painful, and he and I have talked about regret, and we continue to. By the way, it was his birthday yesterday. I got to send him a gift, and it was awesome to just celebrate my dad with meaning. But what made this birthday special yesterday was, oh, 30 years. 30 years, I did not celebrate my dad's birthday. 30 years I didn't have any connection to. And as I think about my relationship to Jesus, if I can can redeem something of that narrative, I can now understand why it matters that Jesus is gone. Because when he comes back, we're not having waited for 30 years. I just want to resist the theology that says Jesus is present right now. The Holy Spirit is present. And if the Holy Spirit is God, then God is as present as he has ever been. That is not a consolation prize. That's just sound doctrine. But the fact that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father means that when he comes back, oh my goodness, this party is going to be so good, the heavens will be ripped open. Like we've been waiting generations for this man, this God to come back And the fact that he is gone matters. It matters. It means something. He's gone. He's not here. And if you want to know why that's not terrible news, come next Sunday. Gotcha. Because we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit next Sunday, should the Lord allow me. This is good news. Because Jesus being gone means it is meaningful that He is coming back. This is exactly what Jesus told us 
in the core text for this entire series, John 14, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I not have told you that I am going? I'm going away. I'm getting out of here for a purpose, to prepare a place for you. Listen to how much God loves you in that. His absence is not indifference. It is preparation. Oh, I'll come again. If I, if, if I go, if I go, guys, if I leave, I'm coming back to take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. I think as Pentecostals, we, we so often are like, Jesus is in the room right now. Can you feel it? Just, just change the language and I'd be fine with it. The Holy Spirit is in the room. If you say God, God is in the room. Can you feel it? Great. Yes. Awesome. Wonderful. But what if you also sat in the distance? Sit in the waiting, in the weight of the waiting. Let that be meaningful. Jesus, I'm thankful that you're gone right now because that means that the Holy Spirit is here and I can experience power, but it also means it's so good that you're coming back. Because as you said, Lord, you know the way to where I am going. We know you are the way. Hmm. So, today, you are invited. I am invited. We have this invitation to affirm the most important belief in all of human history. And it's the answer to the question, do you believe in Jesus? Not whatever version of Jesus has been twisted into some different person, but this Jesus, the Son of God, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, buried, descended to the dead, resurrected, seated at the right hand of the Father, and coming again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in that Jesus? If so, I want to invite you to affirm your belief as we pray the creed together today. In fact, I'm going to invite you to, to stand to your feet if you're able, and if you would like to affirm this, if you are not able to stand to your feet, you can affirm this just as well sitting. And then, and then um, when we're done... I'm going to have one more vital thing to say to you that I think is, is incredibly important. Um, and, then, and then Chris is going to lead. Um, he's going to play. He might sing a little bit. We don't know yet. We'll figure it out as we go. Uh, but I feel like it's important for us to respond to the Lord today. Um, and then I want to pray a blessing over you. And um, by the way, if you have kids, um, make sure that you get them at some point today. Our Life Kids workers will thank you for that. And then you'll be grateful when you sign up to serve in Life Kids that parents also come and get their kids rapidly. Because we do desperately still need you to volunteer. Um, the next generation is so important. Pour into their lives. And if you don't, I'll take a Sunday off and do it. Uh, and they probably don't want that. Um, <laughs> Will you pray the Apostles' Creed with me? It is on the screen. Just so you know, for our, um, uh, our sensibilities here, uh, we have removed the word Catholic Church just because it means global church, but we're just saying Christian church for the, for the sake of uh, uniformity here. So read this with me, and as we read it, let's make this a declaration of faith and a prayer that this would be more and more true in our lives. Let's pray. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the everlasting life. 
Amen. While you're still standing, let me share one final thought with you. Uh, What we believe about Jesus is absolutely a matter of life or death, but it is not actually enough to simply believe what we just declared about the creed. Jesus' last words to his disciples before ascending to heaven were marching orders. In Matthew chapter 20, it says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus promises to be with us in spirit. He has sent his Holy Spirit to be the very presence of God here with us now. But he's also challenged us to not simply believe a creed, but to share it, to go and make disciples. It is important. We sang this earlier on our Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and again on Sunday. The gospel is made perfect in you, but it must also be perfected as it flows through you. So I pray for you today. And as I pray for you, I want to invite you that when I say amen from this prayer and this blessing, I just simply want to pray over you. I want to invite you again, if you need to come up, if you need prayer to receive Christ or for any other area in your life, come. If you need to pray for people who are not walking with Jesus, come. Say their name before the Lord at the altar today. And if you need to linger in worship and prayer, you are welcome to do that. We do invite you to linger in worship and prayer with your kids. So we're going to figure out how to be timely and all of that, but you're welcome. So Jesus, we thank you that you are who you say you are. Friends, may you know who Jesus really is. May you find that your sins are forgiven as you consider your own name in place of Pilate's name. May you receive Jesus' life-changing, bondage-breaking love. May you be led by Jesus out of captivity and into everlasting life. May you you carry the name of Jesus with you wherever you go. And may his love overflow from your life into and onto the world around you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.